Good morning, Pinelands. My name is Janine Clotius, and I'm a member here. And today's scripture reading is Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green plant, or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Word of the Lord. Let me uh, me pray and just, just get right into it. Heavenly Father, we need to understand how every single text is about the glory of Jesus and our need for him and how we live in light of his glorious sufficiency in the midst of our deficiency. So God, would you help us by the power of your spirit to rightly show, as Jesus said, that the, all the scriptures are testifying about him, including this one and help your people leave here refreshed in the sufficiency of Christ above all things. Amen. All right, I wanted to read something from the Westminster Confession 17.3 before I started talking about the devil and all of uh, his tactics. It says, nevertheless, they may, speaking about believers, the temptations of Satan and the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them and the neglect of the means of their preservation fall into grievous sins and for a time continue in them and incur God's displeasure and grieve his Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts have their hearts hardened and their conscience wounded, hurt and scandalize others. Bring temporal judgments upon themselves. So basically the devil works primarily in our internal selves. Now, the confession saying is that the devil doesn't primarily do something to you. Hocus pocus puppeteerish, but he, he, he primarily assaults your conscience and your heart and your soul with with lies. And basically this is what we're going to be talking about um, through revelation nine. Now, just, j- just to remind us briefly, the trumpets. Okay. So we, 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 uh, the seals are before this, but the trumpets are telling us a spiritual element of God's judgments on this time period. So the trumpets are giving us a spiritual perspective of how God gives us over to things that are judgments particularly here with this army of locusts, which are just pictures of a demonic force. Uh, Also, we remember last time we, we ended with the third trumpet speaking about blindness and how it's, it it spoke about a spiritual blindness in the world. They, they see, but they don't see. So what we're going to learn in these parts of chapter nine is what is this spiritual blindness that is all over the globe about? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from these figures that come out here. Now there's two kinds of people in the, and by the way, I'm going to look over here 
so that people inside can, can see my face looking at them. So if I look over here, don't be worried about, um, someone reminded me of that. Hey, by the way, you need to look at the people that are inside as well. Um, so I will try to do that. Uh, all right. I just, my mind got a moment blank. So there's two kinds of ways that, that we could respond to demons. If you go to a church like ours, you probably don't think they really exist and you don't talk about them very much. And whenever anyone talks about the devil, you think it's hocus pocusy and, and, and just, you know, uh, crazy, uh, charismatic or whatever. Right. Um, Presbyterians don't think they don't function like there's actually a devil. And then you got the other side of the spectrum where the devil is like under every rock and every crevice. And all you talk about is the devil. Now, revelation acknowledges demonic things, but in a way that is Christ centered. So it doesn't, it's not indifferent to demonic things. It's not obsessed with demonic things, but it's aware of how the devil works. Listen, if you don't understand how the devil works, you will not understand how God works. And if you don't understand how, if you understand how God works, you will understand how the devil works. So basically we're going to get some demonology through this text. Okay. We're going to understand the way that the kingdom of darkness attacks us and how we see it and how we engage it. So here's the first thing as we have healthy demonology that is not indifferent or obsessed is we understand that the demonic realm is unified and organized. Look at it says in verse 11, they had a King, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in the Greek, he has a name Apollyon, which means destroyer or destruction. So listen, this demonic army that is pictured by locusts, they're not psychotic vigilantes. Okay. They're not like someone who walks into an airport or into a, a, a previous employer and just starts acting crazy. They are organized, very, very, very skilled, very experienced, very tactical, very wise, and very much cohesively doing something. When you think about the demonic realm, do not think a bunch of vigilante, crazy, Hollywood, psychotic, foaming in the mouth. Think U.S. Army. Think strategically, experienced, and tactical, and organized. And guess what? They've been practicing for a really long time. Now, I don't care if you think the earth is 6,000 years or, or 6 billion years. It's still a long time that the earth has existed. And they have been practicing their craft for a long time, way before they don't die. They, they were born like we were, they were, they were made, but they don't die like we are. So they've been around doing their thing. And so John wants us to know that the enemy realm has a unified, structured, tactical leader and plan to jack us up. Okay. And this means if we are facing a unified, organized enemy, that Christian vigilantes will not be a solution. What is a Christian vigilante? It's all you Christians in Miami who think that you with your Bible and by yourself with your devotion is going to combat the devil. Guess what? If he is unified with an army, you cannot be doing your thing by yourself. <laughs> You're facing a unified army, which means you cannot be the super individualistic Christian. If the devil is unified, then we can't be churches that are all doing their own thing by themselves. Let me explain what that means. In Miami, every, everybody wants to start their own church, right? And they want to start their own church that is by themselves because we get it. And guess what? <laughs> if you've got a church that's just by yourself uh, facing a unified army, you're not going to be effective. We cannot be solo Christians. We cannot be solo churches. We must be organized as well. If we are facing a demonically or we need ministers who have been trained to do their job, not just every single person who feels called the Lord and has no formal. Listen, we don't send men to Afghanistan to fight if they just have a calling in their minds, do we? Do we do that? No, you put them in boot camp for six months. If we have a tactical enemy, then we need to have men that are prepared and are not just 
using the Bible very loosely and incoherently. And they just said, I'm letting the spirit lead. No, we need men who have organized gospel theology because we have an organized enemy. We need men who are organized in what we believe about God and can bring that cohesive Christ centered organization to the world. Organized enemy means organized opposition of him. And not all of this loose beloved Christians in Miami who are not under elders at a local church will not help when you have a demonic army who has oversight to do what they do. But here's something else really important about unified and organized is that we need to be unified and organized in something that actually can unify us. If we're going to face this unified army. Now, a passage that I think is really helpful is Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 says this. Diligently keeping, verse 3, the unity of the spirit with the peace that binds us. There is. So what is it that's going to unify people so that we can be unified against this unified threat? One body and one spirit. Just you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. So what do we need? We need all to have a hope that is looking to Christ and what he's done for us. One hope, not many hopes. We need one faith, one body of truth that is all Christ centered that we are all trusting in. We need one calling of salvation. We need one God who is the architect of all. We need one baptism. Baptism is just your story in the life, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. We need one story to identify us. One hope, one confidence. Basically, we are only going to be unified if we are all comprehensively looking to what Christ has accomplished supremely by himself for us. That's the only thing that will unify us. Which means there are certain things that will not unify us. You know what they are? Cut and paste theology will not unify us. If we use the Bible, but we don't have it it's connected to its one hope, one faith, one Lord center, it will not unify us. Hashtag theology will not unify us. You want to know what hashtag theology is? It's people throwing around all the modern hashtags like BLM and ALM and no, no justice, no peace. Those hashtags will not unify us in Christ. They won't. What does Paul say? You have to be unified. You don't need modern hashtag theology. You need ancient gospel stuff to unify you. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That brings us together. Ethnic things and racial things will not unify us. Being pro-America or anti-America is not big enough to unify us. That's not big enough. One hope, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That brings us together. Not being for or against. I'm not saying you should be for or against. I'm just saying that that is not what brings us together as we face this army. It has to be something Christ specific. Beloved, virtue singling will not bring us together. You know what virtue singling is? It's everyone walking around with their ethical, you know, flag that they're waving. And I'm for this and I'm for that. Beloved, that will not bring us together. Only gospel signaling will bring us together. One hope, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That is what brings us together. Who is voted in 2020 will not bring us together. But the fact that God, the father has elected his beloved son to be the once for all king of the ages, that brings us together. If we are going to realize that we have a unified, organized army, we need to unify on the supremacy of gospel, Christ, redemptive, grace things to be collectively facing that. I love it. All those other things, they don't bring true unity. They just bring more divisions, right? Why are we so divided? Because we're not Christocentrically unified. We're trying to find these other things to unify by. And a unified army means we have to have a really big God centered, Christ centered unifier and nothing else can provide that. But here's the second thing I think is very important to bring as we engage the devil. And that is that it's chaotic, but it's confined. The demonic world is chaotic, but confined. It says they were told. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plants or any tree, but only those who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. 
So basically chapter seven talks about the people who were sealed. And we explain that very clearly sealed basically means that you are those who have sovereignly by the grace of Jesus been preserved and, and secured by the lamb's work. You have been secured in the slaughter of Jesus. That is what it means to be sealed. So in the midst of all this demonic, demonic chaos, guess what? It's confined and it cannot attack Christians in their spiritual gospel security. So as God is like, listen, I'm going to unleash this demonic army on the world that is guess what the things that you have in Jesus, the, 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 the benefits that you have in Christ cannot be touched by this demonic world because you're sealed by the powerful rescue of the lamb. Listen, there is no Christians being possessed by demons. We are sealed by the Christ. The Holy Spirit is not jumping out temporarily and Christians so, this, so the devil can then possess us. We are sealed and secure perfectly by our king. When you see all this chaos, Christians, you need to understand that your adoption, your justification, your regeneration, your sanctification, your glorification are secure and will never be rocked even a little bit by the enemy. Understand something. This is chaotic but you are confined in Christ and secure. I love Colossians 2. Colossians 2 says, he erased the certificate of debt, verse 14, with all of its obligations that was against us and opposed us and is taking it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. So what did this gospel victory taking our sins to the cross and removing them? He disarmed the rulers. That's about the demonic world. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them by him. Guess what? This is like ancient Rome imagery. It's, it's a picture of a defeated army that's walking through the city and they have no more weapons. God is saying, Christian, when you embrace Christ and the forgiveness of the gospel was applied to you and the power of the rest was given to you, all of the enemy's tools to, to take you away were taken away and you are secure. The devil has nothing on you. And that's something that Miami people need to understand. Because Miami is full of churches that are trying to make Christians think that the devil got something on you. And he can possess you and he can, att- no, no, he can bother us. He can afflict us, but we are secured by the gospel. Got nothing on us. He cannot take what we have in Christ. He cannot stop our mission. He can, you know, he can intimidate, but he cannot stop and annihilate. He cannot do anything. So guess what? We don't have to sit over here, run around scared and wondering about the devil all the time. We don't have to be trying to, you know, here's what happens when you have a very scary enemy. You have a tendency to want to not make him too mad because he's going to do something to you. But we don't have to, we don't have to play games, the devil and barter with him and, and be a little bit less explicit for the gospel because we are secured. This chaos that is unleashed is confined and God wants us beloved to really understand that in the midst of God's judgments, in the midst of him unleashing demons to do what they want with those, you are secured in the gospel. Revelation is not a book where you're supposed to find security by unlocking some Bible trivia code of modern prophecy events. That's not what Revelation is doing. Revelation is over and over again saying, be secure in chapter five. Be secure in chapter five. Be secure in what Jesus did, not in the latest prophecy guru giving you some secret code about the present. Be secure in the fact that you have Jesus, the one who lived for you, died for you, and was raised. You are secure. You can no longer be oppressed and controlled by the devil. There is chaos, but it is confined. Beloved, and I want to say something just as a warning and reminder. The devil works through chaos. So right now you see civil unrest. And you see all the craziness from pandemic. You can be sure that that's not God's tools to move the people of God. God does not work through chaos. God judges through chaos and he gives the world over to the agents of chaos, but God works 
through gospel security in Christ. That's how God works. And the devil wants us to get all caught up in the chaos, get all caught up in the hype, get all caught up in the frenzies. That's not the Lord, beloved. The ages of chaos want to get everyone riled up and scared because guess what? When chaos happens, fear happens, and then slavery happens. When chaos happens, fear happens, and then you become enslaved because of your fear. But if we know, if we all know that we are sealed in the midst of the chaos, we don't have to get caught up in the fear frenzy. We can be securely knowing that we have everything in Christ secure. So it is chaotic, but it is confined. Only those who do not have God's seal on their foreheads experience this. Isn't that good? <laughs> that good? Here's the third thing about engaging and understanding the, the, the dark world is we need to understand that this is a matter that is soul and spiritual. Soul and spiritual is what's going on here with the demonic attack. I looked and I heard an angel flying overhead, crying out a loud voice, whoa, 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 to those who live on the earth because the remaining trumpet blast of the three angels are about to sound. The fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fallen from heaven. Now, what is this falling star? Well, let me get more water. It's extra hot today, so I'm like extra wet today. All right. Any of you guys familiar with Isaiah 14, 12? Satan is said to be a fallen star. If you See later in this verse, it says this fallen star is the one who organizes the locust army. So this fallen star is a way of speaking about a fallen angel. Now, when did this angel fall from his position? Well, you could say, well, it happened in, when, when, in the beginning when, when the devil sinned and they followed him. But actually, if you go to Job, the devil is still in God's presence in the book of Job after the fall, right? This is the fall of the demonic realm in the resurrection and ascension of Christ that occurred uniquely in that event. You say that that sounds weird. Well, let me read a verse for you that can help you. John 12 30. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. When did that happen? It happened when he was resurrected and ascended. So basically this demon and his crew are those who have experienced the defeat of the gospel and they have come down to earth to bring consuming, destroying judgment on those who are not sealed. You say, why locusts? Well, the locusts just speak about the prophet's language of consuming destruction by things. Now you say, why describe fallen stars and angels with locusts? Because John does not want you to just hear John say, hey, guess what? The demons are really bad. Avoid them. He wants to give you a picture of something that destroys that's very vivid. So there is this army that is led by this fallen star that consumes people internally in the depths of who they are. If our ceiling is spiritual, if our ceiling is spiritual, then the attack of the army is spiritual. You follow me? If our ceiling is spiritual, then the attack of this army is spiritual. And they have a masterful attack. It, it, it feels like being stung by a, a scorpion. It is painful. It is torturous. It is paralyzing. It is consuming, but it's limited. It says five months. It tells us something that is limited. And guess what? If you see the, the text, it says that the abyss was open and all of this demonic army came from the abyss. How many of you Bible nerds know what the abyss is? The abyss is a place where the really bad demons are on timeout. Now, how do you, how bad do you have to be as a demon to be put on abyss timeout? Pretty bad. So think about this. These are this army of demons that afflicts humans in the core of their cells is people who have been unleashed who are worse than oh, it's, it's spirits that have been unleashed that are worse than other spirits. It's almost like remember in, in the eighties when Castro opened up all of the insane asylums and prisons say, go to Miami. Remember that 
There, there goes the Cocaine Cowboys, you know, Netflix series. This is that, beloved. This is an army of the worst kind of demons who afflict us in the most deep, essential places of who we are. They psychologically torment. They, 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 they emotionally torment. They, they, they affect our hopes and our dreams and our beliefs and our loves and our longings. At the core of who we are, they afflict affliction and pain. They bring anxiety and torment and loneliness. They bring anger and hatred and corrupt our desires. Beloved, when we think of the devil, you know how we typically think of the devil? We think of the devil as it's kind of like he kind of, he kind of comes around, he gra- grabs you and he, and he kind of makes you some kind of like puppet. Or we think oh, he's, over, he's over there and he's in the corner of that house over there. You know, he's over there. He's over there in the tree. You know, we, we, we think of the devil in Hollywood um, exorcist terms. Beloved, the devil is smarter than that. He's not hiding in a closet. He's not grabbing you and choking you physically. He is afflicting you at the depth of your soul and what you truly see and believe and feel and, and will in your soul. That's where he works. That's why he's called the tempter. Listen, if you, if you think that's strange to hear, you know what 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says? The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel. So what are demons? What is this legion of consuming locust like depraved worse than other demons? What are they doing? They are consuming people at the core of who they are to convince them that they can fix themselves. The God of this age is blinding reality from their need of the gospel. And that consumes them from the inside out. Beloved, if you look at every single problem in society, at the heart of that, you will see a corrupt heart that is trying to fix itself at the root of all the things that happen. This means, beloved, if the soul and spirit is being attacked by this demonic army, This means that externalistic Christianity will not solve it. Focusing on the outside and what things look on the outside and how how it appears on the outside will not deal with the fact that these, these beings, they afflict us deeply inside of us in our hearts. Beloved, changing a man's environment will not protect you from this army. I think right now, if you listen to like the way people talk on the internet, if we just make the environment of America different, if we just make the neighborhoods different, if we just make society different, then people will internally be better. No, these beings work in the internals of people's souls. It doesn't matter what it's like on the outside. It matters what they do on the inside. And let me read a passage that I think is helpful to bring this out. That these, this, this army, it attacks the soul spiritually, those who are not in Christ. Look at Ephesians 2. And you were once dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. So this is the demonic ruler who has authority in the air, in the atmosphere of the ground here on earth amongst you. So what would it look like for us to be under this demonic ruler and be, be given over to him? What did it look like? We all live in the passage of our flesh. You see that he afflicts you in the depths of who you are. He corrupts the internals of you as an image bearer, carrying out all the desires of the body and mind. He afflicts us internally. They, they, they torment us internally. They bring madness from the inside out. Beloved, the demon wants to corrupt our loves, our longings, our desires, our intentions, our, 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 our trust. He wants to go deep down and afflict us internally through his army and beloved and just giving some application about the fact that there's this demonic army who has a soul emphasis, a spiritual attack on people that is locust like consuming and destructive and afflicting. When you think about what's most dangerous in your house, it's not something outside beloved. You know what the danger is in your house? is the inside of you that would be most inclined to trust in anything that's not Jesus. When you look at church, we're at Pinelands. Let me, 
me look on the inside. When we look at the world right now, and we look at riots, and we look at the Marxist conversation, and we look at pandemic, and we look at shootings and all this stuff, when you, you know what the most greatest threat to Pinelands is it's not anything in the environment outside. It is the hearts of people inside that will be inclined to not think that the power of Jesus is the only solution. And there's some power out there to solve things. If the demonic army targets what is at the core of people, then the solution has to be a gospel solution. Beloved, you know what the devil likes to do? You know what he loves to do? If, if his army is sent out to afflict us and deceive us internally, if that's what he does, you know what he loves to do? He loves to make Christianity all about the outside and external. You know why? Because it's smart. You're deflecting where he's actually working. So in Miami, guess what? This is what it looks like. We got a bunch of Christians who have reduced Christianity to outside stuff, externals, appearances, cliches and sayings on the outside, just really be pious. And the devil's like, I love that kind of religion because it leaves the inside where I corrupt and afflict and I consume untouched and unprepared and unguarded. But beloved, we know that the reason why the devil is obsessed with the outside is because the true work of the gospel is in the depths of your soul, right? So he deflects. He wants us to be externally obsessed. And not us give attention to the very heart of the soul that trusts and receives God in the depths of who they are. He wants to be all uh, deflecting on the outside, the environment. He wants to make us think that everything wrong in this is because I had a, this kind of dad. I had a, this kind of neighborhood. I had a, this kind of situation. And the devil's like, yes, my locust army is able to consume you internally, deceive you internally as you get stuck on the outside. Here's my last point. No, actually, it's not my last point. It's not my last point. I have one of two more points. What we understand by this whole trumpets of these locusts that are led by this fallen star is that the deepest problem, the deepest problem in society is satanic, not psychology or sociology. The deepest problem is satanic, not psychology and sociology. Now this is a problem for us Westerners and particularly us Presbyterians, because we think everything is just an intellectual problem or a behavioral problem. And we're like, the devil's not the problem, but, but John is telling us the devil is the biggest problem on the world and your sinful heart. So these beings who God unleashes to bring chaos, they are bringing a lots of problems as demonic beings, which means that our deepest issues are not biological. Our deepest issues are not economic. Our deepest issues are not social. Our deepest issues are not political. Our deepest issues are not environmental. Our deepest issues are not educational. Our deepest issues, listen, let me, let me get real in the kitchen. Our deepest issue in America is not white privilege. And white privilege, white privilege. Do you think that is what the church is mostly concerned about? This locust army is way deeper and problematic than that conversation wherever you go with it. White privilege. Demonic, abandoned, Apollyon-led army issues, beloved. That's not the biggest problem that we're dealing with. That's not what we have to be concerned with. Our deepest concern is that there is a dark realm that has an organized corrupt army that has been unleashed sovereignly by God to bring chaos in the souls of men on this planet. That is what is essentially most troubling and most dangerous as we look at everything. Now, as I say all that, you may say, wait a second, wait a second. You're saying that everything you just discussed does not matter. No, no, no. I'm saying that we are the church. We deal with the biggest problems of the, and the biggest solutions. That's what we're here for. Now, in your other hats of the society, you may worry about these things in different ways. So, beloved, Revelation is saying that the world has a dragon problem. Okay? Chapter 12. The dragon is the one who is fiercely opposing God. And, and there's a lamb and the dragon. And John is saying, listen, 
there is a dragon problem. There is a demon problem. And that is what's deeply dangerous about society. So guess what? We don't need sociologist churches. We don't need environmentalist churches. We don't need psychologist churches. We don't need politicized churches. We don't need economist expert churches. <laughs> Why? Because we got this kind of dark, depraved, corrupt, invisible problems, right? Listen, I heard, I heard this uh, famous pastor, and I'm just saying this, just going to nail my point to the ground. This famous pastor got in the pulpit and made a case for why what the church needs to do is be an agent to bring about reparations in the culture. So basically, we got economic problems, y'all. We got, poli- we got to do, no, beloved Jonathan, you got deeper problems in economy. You got deeper problems than the, than, the, than, the, than the politics. Your problem is this invisible army that is underneath everything. That's our problem. Beloved, we need incarnation experts. We need atonement experts. We need resurrection experts. We need ascension experts. We need covenant promise experts if we are facing this kind of danger, right? The devil does not care about all those other things. The devil is afraid of a church armed with the gospel. Let me give you another example of this. So here's another conversation that we're having in the church right now. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation about systemic injustice. And, and you got some Christians that are saying systemic injustice is, is a real thing. And, 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 and we have to, you know, fight and, and win and, and change. And then you got other Christians who are, you know, it's not a real thing. John is saying, that's not the point. You know what the point is? Let me go to Ephesians 6. Here's what John is saying to this locust army that is unleashed in the period between Christ's first and second coming to consume and destroy and deceive. Here's what the problem is. Here's a systemic issue that, our, that we, the church, are, are, are combating. You ready? For we do not wrestle, Ephesians 6, 12 against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's the systemic issue that we are fighting as a church. Say, oh, you don't care about what's going on? No, we care about the deepest danger that walks on this globe. And the devil loves to make Christians think that it's something else and not them. But guess what John is saying? You better know what the threat is. It's the systemic oppression of this locust army that is unleashed on the world invisibly and very actively affecting the invisible part of image bears. Beloved, let me just say this. If our deepest problems are demonic, then we're only going to go to Christ for our solutions, right? But if your problems are all these other things, then you're going to always find some humanistic solution. But when we know, (laughs) you know what? You know why Corona is so scary to to, to, to all of y'all or most of y'all or some of y'all? Because you can't see it. You can't see it and you can't kill it. Beloved, we are thinking about something that is invisible and you can't kill. How do you face that? How do you face that? Only by the power of Jesus. Christians need to wake up right now. We need to wake up, beloved, that the Christians need the power of the invisible Christ who is exalted visibly in heaven. None of this stuff that people are trying to recruit to bring good is going to fix anything, beloved. We have a demonic problem, which means that we need a Christ-specific, gospel-specific solution. Beloved, let me tell you something. There's a lot of families in this church and all of us got drama. All of us got drama. All that Facebook's fake bulky ain't, ain't real. All of us got drama. And you know what? You know what? Your biggest problem in your family chaos is not you, each other. It's the devil. You say, oh, I don't believe that. I'm reformed. All right. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. This whole conversation about spiritual warfare happens right after the conversation about families in Ephesians 6. Why? 
Does Paul just, okay, I'm just going to talk about spiritual warfare. As Paul talks about marriage and family and parenting, he goes into this invisible assault because that is the greatest thing that you're dealing with. You're, you think, you think your complaining, lazy husband or your bitter, frustrated wife is the biggest thing you face in your home. But love it. It's not. You better become really aware of what really you face in your house. And that is a liar who assaults people with all of his gospel garbage to make people think that they can fix them families by themselves and all their tactics. Here's the last point I have. This army is indestructible and is capable. Their appearance of the locusts was like horses equipped for battle. That just, that's pictorial language to speak about power and might. Something like gold crowns on their heads. It means that these, these demons have authority and power and ability and they have jurisdiction. Their faces were like men's faces. It speaks about their intelligence. They're not just these kind of like forces or whatnot. They, they, are, they, have, they have human intelligence, though they're not human. Their hair like women's hair. Babylon is often described in female hair terms. So they have deceptive exotic corrupting appeal. They have hair like women's hair. They have teeth like lion's teeth. They are fierce and aggressive and strong and aggressive (laughs) breastplates. They had chest like iron breastplates. So basically they got, they got something that you can't shoot through. They are powerful. They are resourceful. And they cannot be killed by us. They cannot be killed by us. Actually, demons are going to exist on this globe until the last day. They're not going to be ever stopped by anybody here. They, they get time out in the abyss. But these people, apparently, these spirits got let out of the abyss. They're indestructible. You know what's scary about, about, about our enemy? Is that every bad person, every, every crazy, you know, uh, tyrant, they can get got, right? Like Hitler died. Saddam Hussein died. I won't say what I was going to say. Because if I say that, someone may hear me and it may cause for someone for somebody. If you're a Cuban, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> they all could be God. You know what makes this enemy much more fearful? is that they cannot get got by anybody. They cannot be stopped. Beloved, the, this indestructible, locust-consuming army that assaults men in what is not sealed by grace in their souls cannot be stopped by having better websites. Cannot be stopped by building projects. Let's, let's make the church more, you know, bigger and let's renew like, you know, the gymnasium. Like they they don't care about that. They don't, they don't care about how many people are here. You think, you think this army is like, Oh my gosh, there's a thousand people at that church. What are we going to do? They don't care about our cliches. They certainly don't care about Christians running around barking at the devil, telling them what to do. You you, you think that intimidates them? (laughs) You you see that these, these devils that are all, they're all around here, by the way, I don't know where they're at, but they're always around. You think they look at Christians bossing the demons around and like, Oh my gosh, he just told us to leave. We better leave. Like we don't listen to them. Do you think these people care about branding and, and, and and imaging? And, you know, do you think they care that we walk around the community and and give love and hugs? Do you think they're intimidated by that? Do you think they're intimidated by us marching in a March on downtown? Do you think they say, Oh my gosh, they're marching. They got signs. What are we going to do? Do you think that bothers these folk? I'm being sarcastic and giving like a redundant question, but you see where I'm going with this. <laughs> it's like fierce teeth and iron breastplates and, and, and this, this, this scorpion-like power to, uh, to, to, to corrupt and destroy. Do you think, well, let me ask you this. Do, do you think they care about your Facebook posts? Oh my gosh, they're posted again. They posted again. Oh, what are we going to do? Don't care about your Facebook posts, beloved. They don't care. You know what else they don't care about? They don't care about who you vote for. You think, Aldo, wait a second. What are you implying? 
I'm implying that these people are doing, these beings are doing what they're doing regardless of who's in office. They don't care. They don't care. Now we should care about our country and we should be trying to do the best to bring common good here. But let me tell you something. These beings don't care about who you vote for. So like Aldo, can you give us some kind of like pastoral direction as you just kind of like, okay, here, here's what I'm going to land. So how, how, what, what do we do and what do we think and how do we respond when we see an indestructible army that cannot be stopped by anything? I'll close with this. I'll close with this. Go back to Ephesians 6. So after, after Paul says, spiritual forces of, 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 of evil in the heavenly places, this is what he says, therefore, therefore, take up the whole armor of God so you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having all to stand firm. Stand therefore. What are we going to do? Having fastened the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. You need to put on your soul the power of God's imputed righteousness. You need to take the truth of the gospel, the truth about Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And you need to consolidate all your life by the centerpiece of truth. And as your shoes for your feet, having put on with readiness, the gospel of peace. You need to have readiness, have assault readiness to bring people the gospel that brings peace, eternal peace, divine peace with God and men, not temporary peace. And then he says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Every single dart, every single attack, every single locust is stopped by the shield of what? Faith. Faith in who? Jesus. In what Jesus? The Jesus who lived our life, died our death, and was raised and went back to heaven. Faith in that is our shield. There's one more thing. I mean, there's more gospel armor. And taking the helmet of salvation. You saturate your mind with the protection of unconditional sovereign grace in Jesus. That's how we face indestructible, organized, soul attacking armies in this planet. Beloved, we need to understand that what demons are doing is mostly destroying internally. And what God is doing is mostly renewing internally with the gospel. That's the whole point of this crazy scene. With locusts. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that as everybody runs around with endless panels and endless conferences and endless TED Talks and endless newsreels talking about what is going on and what is the issue and what is the solution, we have the trumpets. We have the heavenly perspective of what is deeply behind the scenes wrong with reality. And as we see the locust army that is organized by Apollyon, by the fallen star with that power and might to destroy those who are not sealed, we confess that we need Christ. We need Jesus and we need to be people who are so sensitive that only things exclusive to him, only things particular to him will actually be a true remedy in the depravity and difficulty that we see right now. I pray that your people would be awakened to this angle and respond in childlike gospel specific faith. Help us, Lord. Amen.